Good morning to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com here. It is Wednesday, the 14th of June, 2023. Good to be back with you here for the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion in Dallas, Texas, wrapping up the last of our testing and severe weather coverage. Kind of combined the two, wanting to test some new technology. Starlink a couple of weeks ago, or a week ago, whatever it was, and um, a lot of back-end testing with our OBS system, our live streams, some of the technology that we use to get that out, and then just testing some of the equipment that we put into Hurricanes itself. These live cameras, the GoPros, how long do things run? How do they hold up in the heat? Not a bad idea to test that in the field operationally, as they say, and we've got some ideas that have hatched because of that, and it'll help us you know, do better at what we do when we do cover hurricanes, which of course is the big draw here for Hurricane Track. All right, so there's that. Let's get on with the update, though. Show you what's happening, National Hurricane Center. Let's go over to the Pacific first. In the East Pack, the 48-hour outlook, there's one little area there, 30% chance of development over the next couple of days to seven days. Got to remember this. This is going out to 168 hours now. A couple of areas to watch in the Eastern Pacific, but I still find it uh, somewhat curious that we have not had a named storm in the Eastern Pacific yet, despite the oncoming El Nino that is getting a lot of fanfare, a lot of hoopla for the uh, this big El Nino. Some people saying it could become record setting. Well, it might. We'll have to see about that. But typically it creates more favorable conditions in the Pacific, eh, but not always. And these things take time to get going and not every El Nino is the same. All right, so no, we haven't had a name storm yet, and it doesn't look like we'll have one anytime soon. Both of these areas, and you can see they're in yellow, low probability of development. Now let's go back to this uh, Hurricane Center homepage and we'll look at the Atlantic, nothing over the next 48 hours, and that extends out to 168 hours as well. But there could be something that we want to monitor somewhere in this area later on. And I'll show you that when we look at the GFS output in just a minute. All right, satellite animation courtesy of our friends at Tropical Tidbits. These are these different clusters that we're watching right here. So yes, an uptick in overall convection or thunderstorm activity. And you can see just a general spreading out of the upper atmosphere like this. There's not one of these kind of a subtropical jet cutting across. That would be very unusual to have it down here. So the upper atmosphere is somewhat favorable, clearly a lot of moisture and instability down here, but nothing to get it all to come together. That ingredient just doesn't seem to be there, that extra kick to get things going and consolidating into something that would be more worthy of watching. Okay, I guess that makes sense. And the same thing in the Atlantic. This is what we call the true color shot. A couple things to point out, first of all, just the lack of dust through here. This is a great product to see it. There's dry air. The Saharan air layer is prevalent, yes, but, and I'll show you that product in a minute, there's just not a lot of dust blowing off of Africa because the subtropical ridge has not been very strong at all. The trade winds are not very prevalent, and so the Atlantic has been warming, and I'm sure you've heard about that. I've told you all about that. We've been watching that, well, like we always do, but yes, the Overall state of the Atlantic, pretty stable right now. Not a lot of dust, pretty stable uh, mid-layers of the atmosphere with that Saharan air layer. But again, you can have the sow, the Saharan air layer, without a ton of dust. So that pattern will probably continue for the next several days, and the Atlantic will probably just keep on warming. Now, there are a few little impulses down here. Here's one approaching the Windward Islands. Uh, but otherwise, the intertropical convergence zone, which is this area right through here, where the trades from the northern and southern hemispheres meet and converge, not much happening there. It's suppressed fairly far to the south for now. That's typical of the month of June. A few other features to note. Huge area of storminess way up here in the North Atlantic. Another mid-latitude cyclone here. And then there's the subtropical jet that's cutting across. And generally speaking, that's where it is, the southeast. And speaking of severe weather, really nasty risk down here today for tornadoes. I'll look at that as we wrap things up in the non-tropical part of today's update. 
All right, so there it is. There's the Saharan air layer, and it's very prevalent. But remember, the Saharan air layer isn't just about dust. That's not every. That's not the whole picture. It's more about what's in the atmosphere, the different layers of the atmosphere, and it's a warm, stable blanket, if you will, that stretches across the Atlantic in this case, very common in the month of June, and typically what will happen is all of these pressure patterns and everything slowly lift northward over the summer months, and by the time we get to around August 20th, roughly, this whole pattern will be way more to the north up here and then it'll get much more moist coming off Africa to the south. Sometimes that happens quicker, sometimes it's delayed. Yes, there will be eventual Saharan dust outbreaks with the Saharan air layer, and then everybody will say we're not gonna have a hurricane season. Comes every year. And this is a great example of how you can have this without dust. I'm pretty sure there's no big Saharan dust sitting in the Gulf of Mexico and as warm as the water temperatures are in here, and I'll show you that in a minute as well, yeah, this is just showing you the dry air in the mid-levels of the atmosphere. And remember, you need a moist mid-levels of the atmosphere to help with that instability. All right, and we just don't have it right now. We also do not have, outside of the mid-latitudes, let's use white to make this pop better. These are your areas of vorticity up here, way up in the mid-latitudes. Nothing to speak of down in the tropics, and that includes the eastern Pacific. Just a few areas of elongated energy of vorticity, but nothing congealing and coming together as I showed you uh, on the satellite imagery there. The animations, nothing really happening. We can see that on the GFS. This is the eastern Pacific, and uh, we're looking at that same product, if you will, the vorticity, the spin and you can see everything kind of stretched out and elongated over here. So let's see over the next week, and yes, remember, we go out to a week now since the outlooks do, if anything comes together. Yeah, they try, but it's kind of a feeble attempt. You see some clusters there, we're at 84, 96. Let's go to 120, Yeah, maybe something by day five, and it tries to come together there, six, and then finally day seven. And yes, I know we can also see this little feature over here by day seven and yes we will need to watch that we'll look at that more closely in the atlantic side of things in just a minute but let's scroll back and just watch the evolution of this yeah something might try to pop in the eastern pacific and yes maybe in the western caribbean so let's take a look at that um, in fact let me just change the region back to western atlantic that helps there the extent as we call it the map extent this is the area that we want to watch in the Western Caribbean. And again, let's just look out and see what happens. Got the trades coming in through there, not very strong. They're not roaring through there, five, 10 knots or so, uh, 48 hours. What's the, what's the seedling? What gives us what we see at, at, at that day seven mark? And uh, the GFS trying to spin something up. Now, just by four days out, 96 hours out, you start to see a little bit of a piling up of the air down here, and you can tell that because you're starting to see this vorticity show up. And there's that other one in the eastern Pacific. So there is sort of a converging of the air down here. Some more cloudiness and showers and thunderstorms would be seen on satellite once we get to four days out. So once we get to five days, it does start to try to come together there. And you can see, look at the wind barbs, counterclockwise flow in the mid-levels, or the lower levels of the atmosphere. This is 5,000 feet, by the way. 850 millibars, 5,000 feet. So yeah, something does try to come together by day five and then day six, still there. And then day seven, it's well on its way. A small aerial coverage size, small tropical cyclone in the Northwest Caribbean Sea. Now, you know, is that gonna happen? Is, you know, this isn't, 10 days out, it's not even nine days, it's a week out, but it's one run, it's the GFS, it sometimes does suffer from a little bit of a jumpiness, bias, a lot of different ways you can name it, um, false alarms, basically. So we'll see. It doesn't mean the model is garbage. We're talking seven days out. I mean, forecasts, let me just give you an example. The high resolution rapid refresh model, a lot of storm chasers use that in forecasters, the HER, for many runs in a row, and it's every hour, it gets updated. 
many runs in a row yesterday evening and afternoon. It was predicting these nasty supercells to come across the Metroplex here in Dallas uh, overnight, three, four, five, six in the morning. Didn't happen. They just dropped it. The herd dropped it. I think it was like after the zero or one Z run, poof, gone. And that's a high resolution model for just a few hours out on a micro scale, yes, with supercells, but you, you get what I mean. It doesn't mean the GFS is junk. I hate it when people say that. There's flaws because they're built by humans, duh. But anyway, we'll watch this. You see the evolution of it. The air starts to pile up down there and maybe something tries to get going. I'll be sure to talk about it each and every day going forward. All right, we'll stay on top of it. Yes, this continues to be a big story, and it really should be. Unbelievable, record-setting now, anomalous warmth, meaning that it is above the long-term average, the 30-year average. Will it mean anything? I'm going to start, stop, I can't say it. It's a combination of stop and start, start. I am going to stop harping on constantly how warm it is and you all are probably like thank you and focus more on well let's see if it does anything all right it's there and so let's see if something happens because of it and of course we have the burgeoning i think that's the right way to classify it el nino out here warmest in the eastern parts of the enso regions getting there in the true 3.4 region as we call it but we still have the cold look here, PDO or the PMM, the Pacific Meridional Mode, just fancy scientific terms. Bottom line, this is cold, this is hot <laughs> relative to average, and this is all warmer than it should be by at least a degree Celsius. And we'll look at that in another uh, product in just a minute. Actual sea surface temperatures, I find it curious that this stays cooler than the rest of the Gulf. Just that darn stubborn pattern across the east of basically North America. And I think we're just getting too much northeasterly, northerly flow. There's just upwelling and disturbed water over here. Um, back to the anomaly product, the Gulf of Mexico as a whole, yeah, slightly warmer than average through here. But that one little area that shows up as a cool anomaly, also, also quite cool right up against the shelf waters. And then even out into the um, southwest Atlantic as a whole, you know, very interesting to see that gradient, if you will, the difference in anomalies over distance, cold to the north relative to average, and then a sharp contrast between that and the very warm tropical Atlantic. Will that mean something later? We'll just have to see. But yeah, this is interesting. And if you're going to the beach down here, you know, it's, it's warm. Water's about 80, 81 degrees, but a far cry from the 82, 83, 84, like southwest Florida. There you go, 30 Celsius. Woohoo, love that. I know I would. Um, and then here's the Atlantic actual temperatures as well. Yeah, you guys that want to go down to Myrtle Beach or Folly Island or Tybee Island or the Outer Banks, bring the wetsuit. Not necessarily that bad, but that's just not the kind of water temperatures that I prefer. Out in the Gulf Stream, though, not bad, 26, 27 Celsius, and even 28 there sneaking in. It's June. We have a long ways to go until August 20th. Things will warm up. All right, so this product, I thought it was done. I asked one of my friends who works at the Hurricane Center, hey, what's up with the, the Reynolds maps? They're not updating anymore. And he's like, well, CPC, Climate Prediction Center, discontinued that product, and it's back. So great. Um, this is... I don't know if this is the seven-day average or if it's just a snapshot like every day uh, because the Reynolds method typically is a seven-day average. But nonetheless, I want to show you what we've got here. This is remarkable. Let's take me away. This is back on the 30th. You know, if I go to the next frame of it, it'll tell me. And there's the 31st. So, yeah, I guess it's daily. That makes sense. So, yeah, let's go back to the beginning and let's skip to the end. This is May 30th, and this is where we are now. I mean, come on. And this is really helpful to understand. Um, I was talking to my friend Dylan Federico last evening. He's the Fox, uh, one of the Fox meteorologists here in Dallas. And um, we were talking about this very map. One Celsius above normal from the coast of Africa all the way over to Texas. And then inside of that is your gradient, right? Your different 
delineations all the way up to 2 and 3 Celsius in the area just off of Africa. I won't harp on this much, but this is truly remarkable. Now we need to see what does it do? Does it add more moisture to the low levels, more instability? Are we going to have these dry tropical waves? A lot of questions now. You've got this background. Will it do something? It's kind of like, real quick sports analogy, you've got this loaded with talent team, whatever it is, basketball, football, baseball, hockey, hockey. And um, sorry for you Panthers fans. Um, and they're expected, whatever the team is that's loaded with talent, to win it all. All right? This is loaded. The talent is there. Energy, heat, latent heat. Will it do something? Will it counter the El Nino? I don't know. And I think you should appreciate my honesty on that. I don't know. And sometimes in science, it's not only okay, but I think it's expected to say that. I don't know. We'll, we'll just watch together. Hey, I do know that today, <clears throat> a nasty uh, setup here, moderate risk down here in Dixie. Is it March or April? No, it's June. Very unusual pattern. You can thank the El Nino for that. Subtropical jet displaced a little far to the south. You got your energy roaring across this region. The dynamics are there. Bottom line, you folks in Dixie, all right, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, it really looks like something you'd see in March or April, especially not June. The tornado threat, very significant there in southeast Alabama, southwest Georgia. Heads up, okay? Seriously, the wind damage absolutely could be problematic. And then, of course, significant hail coming out of where I am now, roughly. Yeesh, my flight out of here later today could be interesting. I'm leaving, hopefully, before the convection starts to pop because I don't like turbulence very much. That's just not my cup of tea. But be aware of this. I'm sure you are. All right, just make sure you have a way, as they say, to get alerts, because you want to be alerted. And if you got radar scope or something like that, stay on top of it, especially down there in the heart of the South. All right, got these tracking maps. I appreciate everybody that has purchased one. Um, I shipped every one of them uh, that are going to be there for Father's Day, That uh, for those of you that wanted to order one. I think there's still time, Father's Day, of course, Sunday, so you want to get the mail on Saturday if you want one of these for your dad. Uh, the dad in your life, I'm a dad, and I made these, so I've already got some. But uh, I can mail them, uh, I'm flying today, but I can mail it tomorrow. That's probably the cutoff, and then it would get there probably Monday. But go to this link right here, hurricanetrack.com slash track map, and you can order yours. I'll put it in the description of the video through PayPal. And it's only 20 bucks, and that includes the nice, sturdy poster tube that I send them in. Uh, one of our patrons provided me a box of 50. So when they're all gone, they're all gone, and we're getting close. And I do appreciate it. It's nice to get this piece of artwork and old-school tracking technology into your hands. And it makes me proud because I, I designed that map. I drew it. I've told you that. So it's just a neat thing, and I do appreciate it if you want to buy one. Uh, for Father's Day or even after Father's Day. That's how you do it. So it's quiet so far as we wrap this up. We'll see how long it stays that way. I will be back tomorrow at some point and uh, do another update. We'll watch that thing in the Caribbean, see if the GFS is just teasing us, or do we have something that will make it not quiet any longer. Maybe that's what the update will be titled eventually. Quiet, not any longer. Kind of a weird way to say it. But whatever. All right, let me get this online for you. Thanks for tuning in as always. I'm Mark Suddeth, Hurricane Track. We'll talk to you next time.